college football. It's one of the most uniquely American things I can think of. It's a sport invented by Americans, played for the most part by Americans, and in a collegiate athletic system that exploits scores of young black men by constantly leaving them bereft of the fruits of their labor. Yep, sounds pretty American to me. So if we were to look at this flawed yet still somehow endlessly captivating and weird sport and look for its ultimate defining moment, what would that look like? There are certainly some intriguing candidates. Kick six, band on the field, App State beating Michigan. Okay, that last one may have been a shameless plug, but you get my point. But something is turning me off with each of those plays. The kick six, for example, had widespread national ramifications as it effectively knocked off Bama's title hopes and more or less sent Auburn to the BCS championship. I'm looking for a play and by extension for a game that's completely self-contained. I want a college football play where nothing that the two teams does, no possible outcome of the game at large, will have any effect on the national landscape. Just two teams pointlessly hurtling their bodies at each other. That, to me, is college football. The band on the field fills this requirement nicely. Cal finishes the 1982 season 6-4, and four, Stanford 5-5. Five and five. The outcome of the play had no larger impact besides being weird. But the Cal-Stanford rivalry, one of the biggest collegiate rivalries on the West Coast and in the nation at large, adds another layer of interest to this play. Fans who don't pay attention to the Golden Bears or the Cardinal might casually flip over to this game simply because it's Cal-Stanford. And because I want my game to be completely self-contained, with no national interest at all, I'm ruling rivalries out. App State and Michigan aren't rivals, but like I said before, Michigan came into this game in the top five, and their loss completely changed the title race in 2007. Also, I just wanted to show this play again. Isn't it great? But let's be careful not to get too out of left field here. For example, another play from the absolutely insane 2007 college football season could make a compelling argument based on the requirements I've laid out. Here we see Trinity University beating Millsaps College on the last play of the game, a play which involved 15 laterals spanning 62 yards, and which has come to be known as the Mississippi Miracle. Self-contained? You bet. Rivalry? Nope. But take a look at where we are. This is a Division III game. The stadium could easily pass for a nice high school stadium. The video of this play isn't even being taken from the traditional broadcast angle, and is instead from above the goalposts. This just doesn't feel like college football to me. Maybe I'm just being picky. Or maybe I'm just drawing this out for the sake of looking at more plays. Who knows? Anyway, my point is that the so-called crowd pop is essential to my search. The passion of hardcore college football fans is unmatched, and it's something that makes the sport so great, and 2020 so... weird. A home crowd pop is unmatched. But don't underestimate the value of the road crowd pop. Whoa, he has trouble with the snap! So, my three requirements. Self-contained, no rivalry, crowd pop. Got it. Now, there are some games that would fit very snugly into these requirements. Take, for example, Kansas beating Texas back in 2016. Texas was mired in a miserable season, and Kansas was, well, Kansas. The Jayhawks and Longhorns aren't rivals, and despite KU's football doldrums, the game had a decent fan presence. But there's no defining play from this game. No miracle, no game ceiling pick. Just Kansas beating Texas. In football. I repeat, Kansas beat Texas. In football. Now, before I reveal the winner, I want to show you some of my finalists first. This is a play from a 2002 game between Iowa State and Texas Tech. The Cyclones come in ranked 11th, but don't worry. After this game, they'll lose six of their next seven and finish the year seven and seven. Texas Tech would finish a respectable nine and five, but neither of these two squads are world beaters. The play I'm about to show you takes place at Iowa State, so the crowd pop element is there. 
and no one would call the Cyclones and Red Raiders rivals. The quarterback for ISU is Seneca Wallace, who would go on to play quarterback for the Seattle Seahawks in the NFL, and he clearly stands out as a future pro in this play. It's uploaded to YouTube in grainy glory with the simple title, Seneca Wallace, The Run. I'm second and ten. Wallace looking for the second option. Still looking, still looking. Back to the 30, scrambling. Tight throws down inside the 10. Look out! Looking for a block. Gets it! Wallace, touchdown, incredible play! Now that was epic. One player just taking over on a chilly night in the middle of Americana. That is college football. But I think we can get better. And more importantly, sillier. So much of college football relies on silliness. Silly mascots, silly coaches. I'm a man! I'm 40! I think the ultimate college football play probably gets silly at some point, don't you? Ah, you probably know this play, don't you? Oddly enough, it's also from 2002. If you're a college football fan, this is a familiar sight. It gets shown on any countdown of best finishes, best touchdowns, whatever. That probably disqualifies it from the jump. But it's so incredibly silly, I had to include it. LSU, for once, isn't a national contender. This year's Bayou Bengals will finish 8-5, and five, a nice record at some schools, but not LSU. It makes you wonder if third-year coach Nick Saban can truly hang in the SEC. On the other side is Kentucky, a middling SEC program on their way to finishing 7-5. and five. By all means, a positive season for the Wildcats. A win over the Tigers would be a huge lift for second-year coach Guy Morris' bunch. And the Wildcats appear to be on the doorstep of such a victory. They lead 30-27 to with two seconds left. With LSU backed up on their own 25, a win is all but assured. In fact, UK students are already itching to storm the field and have crowded on the sidelines. The Wildcat players have thought ahead and already given Morris a celebratory Gatorade bath. But we're here for silliness. And all of this is about to look really, really silly. Welcome to the Bluegrass Miracle. The play is so unexpected that the broadcast flashes up the wrong scoreboard as the receiver crosses the goal line, narrowly missing a prematurely celebrating Kentucky fan. The Kentucky students at the other end of the stadium start to run onto the field, then have to be ushered away. Guy Morris, soaked to the bone, is forced into a humiliating handshake with Nick Saban. This is a very strong candidate, but as I said before, the fact that it's so well-known, well-known enough to have its own nickname, probably disqualifies it from consideration. But I just had to show it. And for our third finalist, I had to pull out everyone's favorite play. The fake. What's better than a good fake? Fake punt, fake spike, or in this case a fake field goal. It's all wonderfully silly. Michigan State is trailing Notre Dame by three in overtime. If they kick it here and make it, the game goes to a second extra period. Coach Mark D'Antonio has other plans in mind. Check this out. Conroy, it's a fake. Bates is going to throw. Let's go. Touchdown. Michigan State wins it in overtime. The call of the year. That was absolutely beautiful. And at the expense of Notre Dame, just delicious. Now I know what you're going to say, Oh, but Michael, Michigan State was really good this year, and this game served as a catalyst for a great season. Well, if this game was a year later, maybe. As luck would have it, this was the last season before the Big Ten began holding a championship game in football. If this had been the case in 2010, MSU would have qualified and possibly made a New Year's Six Bowl game. However, this year they settled for the Capital One Bowl where they lost 49-7 to Alabama. See? Totally non-consequential. Okay, now time for our grand champion. The play that, in my opinion, encapsulates everything weird, wacky, and wonderful about college football. This is a play that could be described many ways. Epic, meandering, 
flat out bonkers. But most importantly, this is a college football event. So silly, so stupid, so mind bogglingly asinine that the officials on duty were immediately suspended for even having allowed it to exist. Let's set the scene. It's Halloween night, 2015, in Durham, North Carolina. The 22nd ranked Duke Blue Devils are taking on the Miami Hurricanes. The fact that Duke is ranked and Miami is not should already tell you we're headed for the college football twilight zone. Duke is already bowl eligible at 6-1. With a loss, Miami would drop to 4-4 four and, four and lose their second straight game. Somehow, a loss to Duke would not be the most embarrassing in this two-game streak, as the week before, the Canes lost at home to Clemson 58 to nothing. And with just six seconds left, it looks like the Canes are going to make that streak a reality, trailing 27 to 24. With time enough for only a kickoff return, Miami's options are limited. Duke understandably will squib this kickoff, hoping to keep the ball away from Miami's faster return specialists. After that, it basically turns into a game of hot potato. This play never works. And as you're about to see, it doesn't work here either. But then it just... keeps going. Roll film. Take it short. Lateral. They practice that on Wednesday. Time's going to expire on the game, so this either goes or it doesn't. Ball still alive. It's got to be a backwards lateral. Get behind it. Still alive. Duke doing a nice job staying, staying spacing all over. Oh, he got, they got a block. blockers. They got blockers. They've got a lane. 40 yard line. No black shirts between the goal line. Can you believe what you just saw? They're the ruling on the field is the touchdown. The play is under review. What in the world? Out of absolutely nothing, Miami saved its season with a miraculous touchdown. Or did they? As you heard, the play immediately went to video review. The officials were tasked with determining a number of things. Were all the laterals backwards? Did the Miami returner ever step out of bounds? Did a hurricane knee ever touch down with the ball? As you can see, there were flags on the play as well. Duke coach David Cutcliffe was so convinced that the play would be overturned, he remained on the sideline. Meanwhile, the Miami team was awkwardly making its way back from the end zone dogpile to the bench, the college football equivalent of the walk of shame. After some deliberation, the penalty was announced. And there was a block in the back to the return team. At the 10-yard penalty, there will be an untimed down. The play is still under review. Wow. With the penalty on Miami, the return would be nullified. So, why was the play still under review? After four minutes of headset listening by the officials and admirable time-killing work by the ESPN commentators, a decision was finally reached. After replay review, there was never a knee down. Correction. The play is still under review. Replay will still look at it. Or not. We have officially entered the Upside Down. And why not? It's Halloween night and we're at the home of the Devils. Seven minutes had passed since Miami's Corn Elders scampered into the end zone, yet these two teams were still in a merciless limbo. After another 90 torturous seconds, the officials came out again. After review, there was never a need down by any of the runners of Miami. However, the, the blocking question was from the side, not from the back. It's a legal play. Touchdown. Game is over. Hurricanes win. In a decision that absolutely defies logic, the officials picked up the block in the back flag that had been thrown and ruled the play good. 
the very next day, which in the world of college football bureaucracy is the equivalent of a microsecond. The Atlantic Coast Conference suspended the game's officiating crew for two weeks. The ACC pointed out four egregious errors on the final play. 1. A Miami player's knee is down with the ball still in his possession. 2. A clear block in the back was missed before the final lateral. 3. The ACC determined that the official did not effectively communicate his reasoning for picking up the original block in the back flag. And finally, a Miami player ran onto the field from the sideline with his helmet off while the play was still going on. There are two officials with a clear view of this. In any football game, at any level, this is a penalty, which would have negated the touchdown. If the officials had spotted any of these things, Duke wins. The Blue Devils, now 6-2, dropped out of the rankings. Their next game was a 66-31 thrashing at the hands of UNC. They haven't been ranked since. The Hurricanes, still not done outdoing the Blue Devils, would visit Chapel Hill two weeks later and get punked even harder, 59-21. They would conclude their season with a 20-14 loss in the Sun Bowl to Washington State. The outcome of this play and this game made no difference nationally. The Devils and the Hurricanes hurled their bodies at each other with frightening speed and produced one of the most memorable plays of the season, but it seems to have been swept under the rug. The Canes act of highway robbery on a football field was effectively meaningless. This odyssey of a college football play had it all. It was thrilling, dumbfounding, joyous, silly, a game winner, a game loser, a drawn out review, and a controversial ending. In short, it had everything that makes college football, college football. So no, a band didn't run onto the field. We don't call this play a fancy nickname like the Kick Six or the Bluegrass Miracle. But I call it something else. I call it the ultimate college football play.